Welcome to another episode of Practical Welding Television. I'm your host, Amanda Carlson, and I'm here with Mike Merriman and Larry Clevenger. How are you guys doing? It's been a while. Been a long time, too yeah, long. Yeah, been a long time. Well, today we're going to be talking about plasma cutting. Uh, we're going to discuss safety, we're going to discuss consumables, and then we're going to do a little bit of demonstration. What do you guys think about that? Sounds like fun. All right. Yeah. Uh, plasma cutting, what is it? Plasma cutting is, is uh, the fourth state of matter. And basically what it is, it's electric over air. Air using to blow out the metal that has been cut. We're gonna use a torch similar to this one here. Got the uh, cord on the end of it and your power comes out through here. We're gonna go down through the electrode. On this electrode, you can see it's got this swirl that starts the airflow. The airflow is gonna then go through a swirl ring through the nozzle where it's constricted, it picks up speed. And then this is the retaining cup. And then it's gonna come out the nozzle and then it blows away the melted uh, metal and makes a clean cut of it. Now we've got a smaller plasma unit here. What materials is, is a, a smaller unit like this best suited for? This one here would be just used for light sheet metal. Uh, type of things like you'd use on an automobile or anything of that nature up to one-eighth of an inch okay. And it will then cut a really nice clean cut out of it. Any particular material? Can we do aluminum? Carbon steel? What, what, what we got? The plasma is uh, very suitable for any type of material that conducts electricity. So uh, It's real handy for mild steel, stainless steel, aluminum any, any of those is where they're probably most, mostly used. Now I have a question. Why would somebody choose plasma over, let's say, the oxyacetylene cutting process? What's, what's plasma got that maybe makes it a better fit for a material versus oxyacetylene? Well, oxyacetylene is limited to carbon steels. So you can't cut aluminum with it or stainless steel. It will melt it, but it won't um, produce a, a clean cut, where plasma will. And also it is quite a bit quicker process because you don't have the heating up uh, period that's required with oxyacetylene. So as soon as you strike the arc, it starts cutting. This is a fairly easy process to learn? Very easy, yes, very easy. Uh, and you can get, you know, perfect your skills and do some intricate work. A lot of artists will use this. Uh, all kinds of, it's using all types of fabrication um, applications. Okay, and Larry, when you're teaching this in your classroom, what's the most important thing that you like to focus on with your students? Well, the first thing you gotta do is the safety part of it, and it is where are the sparks going to go? And you cannot have any combustible or flammable material within the area that you're working. And it is extremely hot, and it, uh, it will cut anything put in front of it. It will cut your fingers, it will cut skin, it will cut paper, it will cut wood, it will cut anything. And later on in the show, we're gonna demonstrate how to cut wood. Okay, with, with the, well that should be exciting. Cutter, so. That'll be real exciting. Yeah. So. Just as in welding, uh, safety is uh, an important consideration in plasma cutting. What, uh, what apparel do we need to keep in mind? What, you know, can you explain that? Well, the, the plasma process is an electric process, so you need to protect your body just as you would with uh, any other electric uh, welding process. So you need to protect your skin, you have to have the right type of clothing on, non-flammable clothing, cotton or wool or a combination of those, no flammable clothing, rayons and so on. So you need to uh, have the right clothing, uh, jack welding jackets like what you two have on, welding gloves, and you need to have the right proper or the correct uh, eye protection, your safety glasses, and this is a protective shield. We recommend for our for what we use here at the school, we normally use a shade five lens, which is a lot different than for uh, stick welding or, or TIG or MIG. Those are normally a shade 10. We use a shade five, that way you can see what you're cutting. This usually works for majority of the cutting that we do. When you get into high uh, amperage, uh, cutting thicker materials, then you might want to uh, consider going to a little bit darker lens to protect your eyes, because the arc is, uh, 
is greater. So you want to protect your protect your eyes at all times. Okay, so. question. Could somebody using plasma cutting, could they use um, a, a regular auto darkening helmet when they cut, or is this the recommended piece of equipment? They can use an auto darkening if the auto darkening will go down to a shade that works for them. Some auto darkening will only go down to a shade eight or nine. That might be a little bit too dark if they're working with real thin materials and, and low amperage. So uh, it kind of depends on, on the auto darkening helmet. Okay. So some of them will not go down to a shade five. Is there anything in particular that we need to keep in mind when it comes to equipment setup? Yes, as with any, any equipment, you need to follow the manufacturer's instructions. Read the instruction booklet before you start. There are different settings. All, there are different manufacturers of plasma. So follow the manufacturer's instructions because the settings are differ from uh, manufacturer to manufacturer. They're all probably very similar and very close, but you still need to follow their recommendations. And you're going to learn also just out of experience what works best for your application. Okay. I, I've, I've read in a couple of articles that have appeared on uh, thefabricator.com that plasma is such a simple process that a lot of people neglect to read the owner's manual. Uh, do you have any specific cases in mind that, that, that you know of that people haven't used the owner's manual and something has happened? We were in an auto body shop one time when plasma first came out. Nobody was aware of the sparks going deep into wherever you're cutting at. And so this gentleman, he went and cut a patch out of the side of the car. And then his buddy called him over and told him it was lunchtime. They went to lunch. When they came back, the car was well done. It had caught on fire. <laughs> so the main thing you gotta watch for is that where are the sparks going and what kind of material is around it so it's not flammable. If you can, always work with a partner. If there's that way, someone, a fire watch, they can watch where the sparks are going and just make sure that things are safe. As Larry uh, had said before, we want to make sure there's no combustibles in, in the area because these sparks, they travel a long way. And they also linger around for a while. So they recommend to stick around after the cutting process or welding process is done, stick around for about 30 minutes afterwards to make sure that there's no, nothing will catch on fire. Okay, now this here is the torch that we're using today, and this is where the electric arc is going to come out of. And it's going to be like that there. It will then go through the metal, and you're going to hold the torch so you're a sixteenth of an inch around it, and then you can move wherever you want to, and it will cut that metal just as fast as you're walking around. Just like that there. Okay, now we're ready to cut a piece of mild steel, and we're going to set the torch up a sixteenth of an inch, we're going to squeeze the trigger and we're going to hear airflow and then the electric current will come out. Now as you're cutting this here, you notice that we generate a lot of uh, fumes and different types of metal produces different films for it. So then come to your breathing apparatus well ventilated area to cut with so that you don't have to breathe all of this uh, contaminated area. So now we're going to cut a piece of stainless to show you how easy it cuts and then a piece of aluminum to show you how easy it cuts. You can't cut these with a torch but you can cut them with a plasma cutter. Okay now when you first start this you're going to hear the airflow, and then you're going to hear the electric current come out and then you're going to start the movement and then as you can just go wherever the line tells you to go, wherever you want to go with it, and you can go at different speeds for the different thicknesses of metal. That's stainless. Now we're going to do a piece of aluminum. Aluminum's going to put out a different kind of a light. Okay, now we're going to cut a piece of wood. But to make the, make the machine work properly, we have to have a piece of metal on top of the piece of wood, and you have to have a ground cable to it. Otherwise, wood is a non-conductive of electricity and it will not work. So now we're gonna cut through the piece of metal and through the piece of wood at the same time.
This was a piece of 3 16 wood. You have to have the metal on it. You can cut it. I wouldn't recommend it. Now we're gonna demonstrate how far a spark will really travel. And so that you can see how clean the chop has to be. And so you have no flammable material anywhere around where you're gonna be cutting. Because this stuff really does fly and it stays hot for some time. Okay, now we're gonna demonstrate a piece of stainless steel. Now we're gonna do a piece of aluminum. Gonna do a piece of mild steel. Let's see how far they go. You can see we get a lot more sparks out of carbon steel. I found a piece of titanium. I just wanted to show you what kind of sparks that a piece of titanium will put out. See, they're a lot brighter, a lot whiter, and they stay hot a lot longer. We're back in the classroom and we're about to discuss some of the problems that you can run into with worn consumables. Larry, how do you know when it's time to change your plasma cutting consumables? Well, when the first thing that's going to indicate is that the cut is crooked. It's going on an angle, it don't go all the way through, or it flares back up on you. And then what you're going to look at is you're going to take and look at the end of this and see how cruddy it is and the hole is bigger than what it should be. And then this is your electrode and the end of it where the current comes through now is the one that uh, it wears out, causing the current now to travel around where it shouldn't. It's supposed to go straight through with the air, but now it wants to wander around and then it makes the cut bigger and wider than what it should be. So it's really important for, uh, for users of plasma cutting uh, equipment to inspect their electrodes just to make sure that, yes. the, that the hole is, is not worn right. out. Right, because when the hole gets bigger, then you lose the force of the air coming through, you lose the arc coming through it, and then the cut just goes crazy on you then. So you have to make sure that you've got a clean hole in the uh, nozzle here, and your electrode is not being burnt away like this is. Is there a timeline as far as how how often you need to replace these items? Or does it just depend on use? This electrode wears out by the stop and start of the trigger. So if you stop and start 100 times, that will wear that out instantly. Where if you turn it on and run, it, the current comes through it and it will just go on for a long, long time. So as many times as you stop and start, is what wears your electrode out. So then, that's what you gotta watch out for. Get your uh, cuts laid out like you're gonna go, get the most travel out of it that you can, and then turn it on and keep it on as long as you can. Another thing to add to that, Larry had mentioned that the process is high energy electric arc and also high air pressure. The, if the air has any moisture in it, that will also wear the Electrodes. So you got to make sure that your compressed air is completely dry when you're using it because water is conductive and it will uh, wear the electrode. And if you look at the back of this here, we have an air filter on the back of this machine here. All of them come with a super uh, filter on it to keep the water out because water really damages this equipment. Okay, now we're going to put this together. This is a retaining uh, cup. We're going to put the nozzle down inside. And inside of that, it has little bitty holes where the air pressure is going to come out. Now we're going to put the swir uh, swirl ring in next. That helps direct the airflow. Now we're going to put our electrode, which is at the very top. The current comes through the center of it. The air goes around the outside of it. We're going to put that in there. And it will drop right in place. Now we're going to screw it to our torch. And as you can see, we have a finger on this torch right here 
that uh, it has to be screwed in tight and grounded in order to make it work. And you make sure it's tight, and then we'll just put our cap, our cone on, and then we're all ready to go. The reason for this little yellow uh, safety trigger here is so that you can lay it down anywhere you want and it won't go off by itself. If this is broken off, then anytime somebody touches the trigger, it can automatically start and uh, it could cause great damage. Well, that about wraps things up for us today. I want to thank Rock Valley College and Mike and Larry. If you have any questions, please visit us on our website, www.thefabricator.com, and we'll see you next time.